thank you, folks, uh, for this. This feels like the match of the day, the last game on match of the day. That's uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a nil-nil for sure. We know this one, but I think ours will be a little bit more interesting. The interesting thing about hearing today's uh, talks, actually, one is how extensive they are and impressive, I have to say, really impressive. Some fantastic history out there. So, in some ways, our talk tonight is about a small history society pulling together uh, what they can to try and find out about some of the, our local history. Questions that, you know, would keep the amateur historian awake at night. I don't know about the more uh, seasoned historian, but certainly the amateur. So, this is mine's a very short introduction, and then Linda's going to talk you through the, the dig. So, here we go. Some 14 years ago, Linda Moyes... Jacqueline Doyle decided that something should be done about the overgrown, close to the public, medieval cemetery on Bridge Street in Salem, and set about raising the, sub the substantial funds and getting the required permission to put that plan into action. The plan was not only to tidy up the cemetery, look after the headstones, have the wrought iron gates restored, put up notice boards and benches, bird boxes and plant wild flowers, but to also put in place an ongoing maintenance program so that the cemetery would be open to the public all year round. In many ways, Better that way. In many ways, this was also the first formative step in the formation of the Salon and District Heritage Society some 13 years ago, with the help and support of the late John Crane, whose book of Cabbages and Kings, A History of Salon, had just at that time been recently been published. In the first chapter, it speculates as to the possible location of a medieval church in Salon. From documentary evidence, we knew that the medieval church sat on top of a small hill and that if you were to strip back the walls and the layered graveyard, that from the bottom of Bridge Street, you would indeed be looking at a small hill. Speculation. We also knew that a church dating back to the very early 17th century was also located within the cemetery, and that the new church, being opened in 1810, that the stone from the old church was sold off to various locations across the village via documentary evidence. What that church looked like, size, shape, actual location, was again a matter of conjecture. We had an indentation uh, in the ground that we thought was the bell tower and the documentary evidence of a possible entrance. 2015, we'd been able to secure our first real archaeological research and dig in the cemetery due to the generosity of the Edinburgh Archaeological Field Society. Unfortunately, we only had two full days, but managed to sink two small shallow trenches in the southeast corner of the cemetery, which uncovered the base of an east-west wall, which was unlikely to have been associated with the 17th century church, or indeed the medieval church. However, we did manage to find pieces of pottery, Scottish white gritty ware, common throughout Scotland in the mid to 12th, 15th century, and the obligatory piece of clay pipe. Nothing conclusive, but we did now have that all-important geophysical survey of the cemetery and a little experience behind us. 2021, social distancing in place, John Crane's wife, Mary Crane, informs us that John has left a sum of money with regards to a project in the cemetery that hadn't materialised, and would we be able to use it? You bet. So, so with a little organising, a lot of organising, the search for archaeologist volunteers completed, permission was granted, and the John Crane dig of 2022 got underway. I'll hand you over to Linda. you all hear me all right? Yeah, good. Thank you, Barry. Um, so this is actually, the presentation actually belongs to our archaeologist, John Gooder, who allowed me to use it. So he is of Access Archaeological Condition Services Limited. So everybody, welcome to the discovery of Salon's Lost Church. So what we have here is um, an aerial photograph of the old cemetery. And the mausoleum dedicated to Lady Kinneder is to the left. And the oldest visible gravestones are to the right. So pay attention to these two little bits of information. We have several very interesting graves in our cemetery, including a servant who died at the age of 94, and John Barrowman, the inventor of a 19th century plough that was sold worldwide. And if you'd like to find out any more, or if you'd like a tour of our graveyard, please speak to Barry. Okay, just moving on. So, the excavation was carried out by John Gooder, assisted by a wonderful band of volunteers, and this is part of his presentation. And the late John Crane, he was a founder member of Salant and Heritage Society, and he was a very keen historian. And it was his long-held wish to find out the lost church. So how do you lose a church? So we will begin the journey through time. 
Now the graveyard in Salon is along Bridge Street, just up here. And we know it is from the Middle Ages due to the fact that it's very much built up and the wall surrounding the graveyard would have been added at a later date. So our lost church had to be there somewhere. But the big question all this time has been, where is it? However, it wasn't actually totally forgotten. It was definitely there somewhere. Um, the first known church dates to at least the mid 13th century. Uh, Vitae Dunkel Densis Ecclesiae Episcorum records that Salon Church was one of three establishments annexed by Bishop Geoff Geoffrey, 1236-49, to the common fund of the canons of Dunkeld. And so basically, Salon Church lost its income to Dunkeld. And it remained annexed to the common fund of Dunkeld until the Reformation, about 1560. And typically, with other churches of that era, monetary difficulties continued in at least the early 17th century. We have records that a minor works new loft was created in 1704. In late 18th century, ministers complain about the church's ruinous condition. So a new church was completed in 1810. The other one must have been falling down. And the old church was demolished in 1811. And over time, the original church is forgotten and lost. But there's some clues there. Tantalizing clues like the church was on the Bray, where was it? Or a headstone placed near the door of a kirk. And the house to the right is known as Kirklands. The field to the east is called Glebe Field. And a minister in a report of 1794 stated the church is in a really bad state, having got no material repairs for a long period. It will scarcely admit to repairs now and it probably must be rebuilt soon. So in 1811, the church committee in the village decided to dispose of all the salvage and material from the old church by public auction. But one condition, and here's another clue, was that the foundations were to remain to avoid disturbing the graveyard. So, the next bit. But we have a definite clue. The original bell now hangs in the 1810 church. So we know that a church definitely existed in 1755. Another clue is that at Devon side, a farm on the outskirts of Salon, there is a stone lintel with the inscription, Glory of God, only 1640. This could indicate a rebuild or the enlargement of a 13th century church. But where was the church? So we'll just briefly look at a couple of early maps. So unfortunately, as we all know, records are very scarce for what are in a really poor parish. And this early map shows a kirk, there it is written there, but not an exact location, so annoying. A slightly earlier map shows the symbol for a church somewhere in Salon. It was definitely there. A later map, 1822, doesn't show the kirk, it's gone, but it does show a very strange rectangular structure. And note that it says Kirkland to the east. Oops. Now here is an aerial view of the graveyard. John Good's nephew flew a drone over it all. And if you look closely at the orange arrow, can you see a very, very faint rectangle in the ground? So for the past few years, it has become even more sunken, as if to say to us, look here. Was this the rectangular structure on the map of 1822? Another aerial shot of the sunken rectangle. Again, you can just see it up here where the orange arrow is. What is it? This one's not quite so clear, but you can probably just see again the rectangular area. And over time, the top of stones sometimes appear. So this would become one of the trenches that John decided to open. Now the headstone just up here is for one Alexander Stocks and records indicate that his lair was by the doorway of the old kirk. But it's quite a distance from that rectangle. So a bit of a puzzlement. Now 
Now, as Barry mentioned, a previous excavation was carried out in 2015, and typically, on the final day, trench two was opened to reveal the footings of a wall and a piece of medieval pottery. But one piece of pottery does not make a 13th century church. And these are the trenches that John decided to open. We've got the sunken rectangular area, 1A and 1B. We've got four, we've got two, and we've got three. Um, number two was previously opened, and after begging him to open it for four days, he finally agreed. So it was called after myself, Linda's Trench. But was it the remains of this medieval church or not? So in each of the five days, we had fantastic support from a crowd of enthusiastic volunteers. They were so keen that after day one, most of them asked to come back for the next four days. An HQ was set up in the mausoleum. I mean, where else could we have our HQ for all of this? So our excavation had started. Our main focus was on trenches one and B, one A and B. However, trenches two, three, and four would prove interesting as well with scope for further investigation. So the dig actually exceeded our expectations. And here is trench one A, and to our amazement, a stone archway appeared. Rumours abounded at this point. Could it be where one of the ministers hid their stash of wine or the entrance to a subterranean room? One of our committee members, Lois, frantically dug away at this arch, only to be told by John, stop undermining the arch. And this trench became known as Lois's arch. So here's another view, everybody, of this arch. So you can see the arch fairly clearly here. You can also see the foundations of a wall. Quite sizable masonry blocks we've got as well. So we had to dug down probably about a meter to get to all of this. And some dressed stone was actually uncovered and it faces the entrance to the graveyard. You can see it a little bit clearly here, sort of carved at the bottom. So is this for foundations, for steps perhaps? So this mis mysterious rectangle was taking the shape of something. Trench 1B on the opposite side also revealed sizable foundation blocks, some of which started to lead in an easterly direction. So what on earth was going on? And you can see the big blocks of masonry here. This bit here is leading east, this bit is joining up the rectangle. And we've got a strange stone here. We still don't really know what it was. We're not sure. Um, so yeah, what is going on now? And this is um, a closer view of the sizable view of a masonry that we uncovered in both trenches, actually. So we had lots of digging by everybody, ably assisted by John, with many shouts of, John, I have found something. Only to be told, it's an early 20th century bottle cap, not a 14th century coin. How disappointing. The weather was very kind, only one day of rain. And the other trenches also proved really interesting. But trench 1A and 1B, but the ones that were beginning to point in the direction of the lost church. And here we've got John's plan of it. You can quite clearly see the archway, the foundation stones, so it looks like big masonry blocks, and another view of the stones that he planned. Poor John couldn't get much time to draw anything because we kept asking him to come over to show us what we'd found. In the end, I think he had to shut himself in the graveyard one evening to try and finish all his plans and his drawings in the hope that he wouldn't be disturbed. But I believe visitors still came to speak to him because they were so fascinated with what we were doing. So, this is the plan of the foundations. Please note there's a slight mistake here. It should actually read the west gable, not the east. I couldn't change it on the slides. Now you'll see that trenches 1A and B seem to line up pretty much with the rectangle. Can you see it all? There's the rectangle. So presumably if we'd excavated a bit more, there'd be more foundation stones coming all the way around here. So, but 
what if a wall leading eastwards? Here we've got it here. What on earth is going on? So, this we think was a bell tower at this corner here where we excavated. Now John and Douglas Spears, five, ar five council archaeologists, have surmised that the sunken rectangle is most likely the foundation of the bell tower of the 17th century because the bell was definitely there. And it would have been added to an existing structure most likely, the lost 13th century church. It had been there all along, we just couldn't find it until now. It's very difficult to date, date this bell tower it's most likely 17th century in date because the stone doesn't appear to be too weathered. As mentioned previously, Salon would have been fairly poor, especially after the Reformation. And the likelihood is the original church would have been kept in use with the addition of a loft to accommodate a growing population in the village and a bell tower. And eventually it all fell into such a state of disrepair as one of the ministers stated that the decision was made to demolish it hence the sale of the stone in 1811, and then the current church was built as a replacement. So why did it show on that early map of 1822 then? Well, it is thought um, that the archway was probably built to strengthen the bell tower, maybe two or three stories, we don't really know, and it might have been only partially demolished to leave one story, which would have become maybe a watchtower or somewhere for the grave diggers to leave their tools. And eventually it was no longer needed, especially after the Anatomy Act of 1830, negating the need for resurrectionists and body snatchers, because we did have them in Salon, I am sure. So it was finally taken away. So you can see here the bell tower, that's the east wall, you know, the stone was continuing. And we think it was probably a plain, simple, rectangular 13th century church, very simple in design, but as we think it was added to a later date, so it was kept in use for the villages of Salem. They couldn't afford to build another church, so we would have reused what was already there. So we think we possibly found the lost church, and we hope have added a footnote to the history of early churches in West Fife. So, before we sort of finish, this is HQ, Remember I said earlier it was in the mausoleum? Um, and here's a photo of myself and Jean Coker, a wonderful researcher from Florida who came over to help us. The plaque at the back, just as a wee footnote, is dedicated to Lady Canedder, penned by Sir Walter Scott, a good friend of Lord Canedder. Not sure what he would have thought about HQ being on top of all this. Then, here we go, some volunteers at work with John as well. Um, some of our finds, by the way, included pantile fragments, small shards of thin plate glass. So I must send some over to Helen after her. She was talking about early glass. And Scottish white gritty ware from the 13th and 15th century. Oh, more than one piece, by the way. And I have to say, it's always nice to see other people working. And here's our happy band of volunteers. And we could not have carried out this excavation without the donation from our kind band benefactor, Mary Kane, our archaeologist, John Gooder, um, assisted as well by Douglas Spears in the Fife Archaeology Department and the Committee of Sound Heritage and Fife Council Cemeteries, who've been absolutely fantastic all this time. When we first said, we want to dig up your graveyard, we weren't too sure what the reaction would be, but they have been absolutely fine with us. And of course, our wonderful band of volunteers. So when is the next one, you might be asking? Well, our aim is to create a new interpretation board for the graveyard and in future carry out a more detailed excavation of maybe the actual possible site of the church, as well as going into the gardens of Kirkland behind Trench Fee 3. But that is another story to tell. So everybody is at the end of the start of a beginning. So I hope you enjoyed our search for the lost church of Salon Thank you for listening. Any questions? And that's just a view of the graveyard of one of the interpretation boards at the entrance. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.